It is beautiful outside, perfect September day with lots of sunshine. It's 8.52 here in New York. I'm Brian Dumble. We understand that there has been a plane crash on the uh, southern tip of Manhattan. You're looking at the uh, World Trade Center. We understand that a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. We don't know anything more than that. We don't know if it was a commercial aircraft. A witness on the telephone who tells us that he has seen an airplane crash uh, into yeah, the World Trade Center. that a plane has hit of the World Trade Center, and you can we do see that there's breaking news that we want to bring you right now. We're going to go to a picture, a live picture from New York City. Apparently, a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. It does not appear that there's any kind of a, an effort up there yet. Now, remember, oh my God! Oh my God! That looks like a second plane. Just saw another plane coming in from the side. So this looks like it is some sort of a concerted. Delivered. effort to attack the World Trade Center that is underway. Here's that an aircraft of some sort did hit the side of the Pentagon. So the first pictures we have in, uh, this is from Somerset County, Pennsylvania. This is where the United Airlines flight, I believe it is 176. This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents, and you can see the two towers. A huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the Today, we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. Hello and welcome to Thin Blue Line Radio, special edition where we delve into the tragic uh, events of September 11th, known to many as the 9-11 terror attacks. I'm JP. And I'm Dave. Now, everyone remembers where they were on September 11th. Uh, me, personally, I was in work. And I was uh, still in college. Everyone remembers where, where, you know, what was going on, even down to, I mean, massive things in history, uh, assassinations, other terror attacks. Everyone knows where they were. But obviously, this was one of the most captured, I believe, uh, whether it be photograph or moving pictures, mm -hmm. uh, also known as video, where it's the most recorded terror attack or the, the most recorded historic event because i believe they teach it in schools now the 9 11 attacks yeah i imagine because when it, it it started and then gave everyone enough time to point the phones up to the sky before the second one occurred and then i think this um, because it's at such high profile locations that have been cctv footage everywhere anyway the likes of the pentagon there's mm -hmm. footage of that just because it's the pentagon there's footage everywhere so obviously September 11th, as it was, as many people, uh, they always say it was a bit of a cliche, but it was a lovely warm day. People were getting ready for, uh, I think there was sort of a, a local vote or election going on at the same time. So there was a lot of hype in the city. And, and as you can see from the breaking news clips that you may have heard or you may have already, uh, you, you, we might have already played a, f a few, that obviously things took a horrific turn for the worst uh, at about uh, quarter nine in the morning. So yeah, about um, quarter past one in the afternoon UK time uh, is when it all erupted. Now some very, very sketchy details reaching us here at Sky Centre. Important enough to bring to you though at this early stage, we believe that a plane has crashed into the World Trade Centre in New York. That happened within the last few moments. No details at this stage as to what sort of plane it is. It could well be... A large plane. We are hearing reports of a 737 not yet confirmed um, yet, although it is a jet. Um, more as we have it. Let's have a look what CBS News is saying, our colleagues over in America. Southern tip of Manhattan. You're looking at the uh, World Trade Center. We understand. First that one, American Airlines Flight 11 from 7:59. It departed from Logan International Airport to Los Angeles International Airport. Um, that was the first one, which flew um, towards the New York area uh, after being hijacked. Um, several people were stabbed on board. There were several calls from flight attendants. And then at 8.46 a.m. for New York, it flew into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Which then brings us on to... Uh United Airlines Flight 175, uh, that departed Logan International Airport at 8.14 a.m., also heading to Los Angeles International Airport. That was a couple of seconds after the first plane, Flight 11, flew into the North Tower. Um, this 
started seeing some abnormalities with this and there was a few near mid-air collisions where planes have had to take evasive action to get out of the, the, the plane's way. It was then at 9.03 a.m. Uh, that it flew into the south tower of the World Trade Center between floors 77 and 85. And then following on from that, um, the American Airlines Flight 77 uh, departed at 8.20 a.m. from Washington Dulles International Airport, once again on its way to Los Angeles International Airport, and at 9.37, uh, crashed into the west wall of the Pentagon. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. We're looking at a uh, live picture from Washington and there is smoke pouring out of the Pentagon. It would appear that there has been another major explosion, this one in the nation's capital. You are looking at a scene of uh, apparent blast aftermath. There is smoke in the air over the Pentagon. We don't know whether this is the result of a bomb, or whether it is yet another aircraft that has targeted a um, symbol of the United States power. Which then brings us on to, which, uh, as it's been said, you, you couldn't imagine things could get any worse. Uh, it was then that people, I think it was about 10 minutes before uh, Flight 77 struck the Pentagon, they started knowing ab uh, finding out abnormalities with Flight 93. Yeah. And then, obviously, the famous Mayday calls. I think there was two separate mayday calls uh, whilst planes were speaking with control and stuff like that and they could yeah. hear the mayday call and people to, to get out. United 93. It's quite harrowing, both of those little uh, clips uh, that was made. Uh, the first day mayday call was by a Leroy Homer uh, and also the second one was made by the, the, the same uh, member of staff on the, uh, on the plane. That left Newark International Airport at 8.42. Uh, and as I say, about 10 minutes, seven minutes, possibly before uh, 77 flew into the Pentagon, that was when they started noticing that Flight 93 was also making some strange manoeuvres, which appeared to be travelling at San... It was travelling to San Francisco International Airport, but it made a U-turn and was heading towards the general area of Washington, D.C., this some people say. Yes. Uh, but then we all know that it was in uh, Shanksville, Pennsylvania, at 10.03 a.m., uh, where I'm not going to say it crashed in a way of the, you know, those people on the flight on the flight wanted it to happen but that was purely because of the heroes on flight 93 the passengers banded together um and they made an active attempt that there's there's recordings out there of the active attempt you can, you can hear the, the passengers trying to get into the cockpit um yeah I, th I think from the other flights there was a lot of um bomb threats mace and stuff like that and used um but by the time Flight 93, as it happened, I think they realised that actually they weren't planning on setting off explosives. They were planning on causing a lot more damage. Mm -hmm. So the heroes on that flight have then lost fear of, well, he's going to blow the plane up and kill us, and thought, hang on a minute, he's going to do a lot worse than blow up the plane and kill us. Um, weird. I think they've resigned the facts that to the fact that one of the best possible outcomes for them is just the plane going down. Yeah. So the, the as you say, the, the heroes of that flight have put up a fight, got the best possible outcome they could have in horrific circumstances. Yeah, because they, they crashed into a field in Stony Creek Township near Shanksville in Pennsylvania. United 9-3, have you got information on that yet? Yeah, he's down. He's down? Yes. When did he land? Because we he, had confirmation. He, he, did, he did not land. Oh, he's down? Yeah, down? somewhere up northeast of Camp David. And obviously that explains the entire event of the day. Now, this happened in the space of within two hours. Um, but obviously the after effects of that day would be even more catastrophic as the day went on. Um, when obviously we, we know that the west wall of the Pentagon collapsed and the two towers at, Nan, at uh, the World Trade Center on 9-11 collapsed, killing numerous, numerous emergency service workers who, yet again, were running to the danger to help those, to save people, to protect the vulnerable and to, to carry out their service while directing other people away from the location, obviously. Um, 
this is where we go into now. Um, once these horrific acts have, have occurred, what happens then? So you've also got, uh, as well as the fire department uh, of New York, they've got their transmissions where um, Pfeiffer, uh, mm. Chief Pfeiffer, sin, uh, and made the first official radio call of the first tower hitting the first, well, Flight 11 hitting the North Tower. Yeah. So you had his call. There's a lot of harrowing transmissions and phone calls and stuff like that, yeah. isn't there? Yeah. But as well as those, you also had uh, the offices of the Port Authority Police Department. Their offices were located in or on the complex. So obviously you had numerous of those officers who were made aware. So obviously the the intentions and the ethos and, and morals kick into a place because then it's people start running into the building. You've got New York Police Department. Yeah, there's loads of quotes of officers saying yeah. there's people there that need saving. There's people there that need our help. And from the most of what I've heard, seen and heard, there's, there's not even a second thought for anyone's own safety. They've just gone, no, there's people there that I need to go and help and just run off without a second thought. Yeah. It's it, absolute legends. Yeah. One of the, one of the, the, the most famous stories, because I know that there was a, a motion picture made of this, was obviously Sergeant John McLaughlin, who was with the Port Authority Police Department. As the, the day's events have commenced, uh, he's gone in and basically got all of his officers together. And he's got countless officers together where they have, uh, they've actually hijacked city, hijacked city buses and they've just filled these city buses with yeah. the Port Authority cops and basically said to the World Trade Centre now. And they've gone down there. Upon getting there, they've got out of the vehicle. Uh, I know that John McLaughlin Pat, his, uh, his uh, chief, his, well, his sergeant patrolman car in one, one side of the trade centre and he's had to run round to where the others were where he's asked for volunteers to go into the building because he, he said to him, look at them buildings, they're burning, we need to go in and at least evacuate people, people are going to want to help. Uh, and that's when he's got together with officers uh, Antonio Rodriguez, uh, Chris Amoroso, uh, Will Jimeno and Dominic Pazzullo. They've then entered the World Trade Centre, not really understanding because once, uh, quite a lot of the accounts say this, that once they get in the building, you very rarely know what's going on outside. They can hear bangs, creaks, yeah. crashes. They can hear people screaming, cries, radios going off and, and things like that. But basically in between the North and South Tower and they meet fire, fire crews who come down and they're basically saying, oh, we're being told to go over to Tower 2 now. And then he's like, well, what's going on in Tower 2? And it was then that the building started to shake and they've started noticing rubble falling through the slats in the roof. Uh, so straight away, John McLaughlin was heavily involved in the 1993 World Trade Centre bombing um, where they drove the truck into the underground parking yeah. uh, in an attempt to knock one tower into the other, yeah. which wasn't successful. Thankfully. Which, funnily enough, going further down the field, it was that corner that was all rebuilt and it was all reinforced, which is where a lot of the survivors, emergency services personnel, as well as civilians, actually were found, was in that 1993 bomb. Yeah, because you've got a reinforced there. section of it where, yeah. thankfully, it's... Uh, held up but yeah as the towers come down on top of them uh, that as i say they've been on on like a mezzanine area between both the towers that is then it took 10 seconds for the rubble for the, the building to start collapsing to the moment where the rubble has impacted where they were stood now again because john mclaughlin had a fabulous knowledge of it he's pointed in the direction of uh, sort of like a stairwell where he knew there was more a little bit more protection yeah I don't think he knew the gravity of it. He was just possibly thinking, go to the, the stairwell because there's another explosion or possibly another plane. Yeah. Not realising that 110 stories are barrelling down coming towards him and his officers. Yeah, because you need some protection to stop you from... Because that is massive. I mean, you wouldn't even be able to imagine that amount of rubble falling down. Mm -hmm. That's un unreal. So as the building has collapsed around them, uh, that's where uh, the... Uh, all the rubble and everything has basically struck where they've been uh, they've been gathered or they've been running towards this stairwell and unfortunately officers Antonio Rodriguez and Chris Amoroso were killed immediately uh, by the falling debris and we know that uh, John McLaughlin and Will Jimeno were obviously trapped but Dominic Pizzullo managed to free himself and attempted uh, to free uh, Will Jimeno However, because the North Tower then collapsed, uh, that is where, unfortunately, uh, Dominic 
Pizzullo, uh, has unfortunately, uh, has unfortunately passed away in that collapse. Um, now, there's a lot of un- uncertainties around Dominique Pizzullo, and I know that there's there's a lot of interpretations of his story through the motion picture and stuff like that. Uh, but I know that there's some accounts out there to say that uh, he actually unholstered his weapon when he got trapped in the second one because he was still alive. I don't think he was immediately killed. I think there was a minute or so that he was still alive and I think he unholstered his gun and tried to fire his gun in the earth through the holes that he could see in the roof to basically attract the attention to where Will yeah, and to try Sarge and show were, people yeah. where he and the others were trapped. Because obviously he might not have been aware that it was... It was coming to the end and, you know, rescue attempts will on go for a while. So I suppose drawing a little bit of attention to yourself is... I mean, to, to be able to think of that at the last post in that situation, to think people are going to need to know where I am. I'm going to start firing through the rubble to try and give them a, a place to look. Uh, yeah, so that that was the, the story of um, Sergeant John McLaughlin, Dominic Pizzullo, Will Jimeno uh, and the tragic... Uh, uh, deaths of Antonio Rodriguez and Chris Amoroso. So clearly throughout this entire incident, the amount of heroes involved, um, the, the numbers go into the hundreds and thousands of people who've tried to protect people. We can't go through them all, so we've been given a list of people that basically stand out. So we'll go through those. If you are aware of anyone or anyone is actually close to yourself, by all means get in touch and, and have, a, have a chat with us and we'll, we'll see if um, for future episodes or future editions of, of September 11th, it might be uh, something we can come out with and, and tell their story as well. But the next officer that we've got on the list is Officer James Leahy. James was a member of the New York Police Department on the day when the towers were hit. Um, he had, it, it's been reported that he's had a fairly tough upbringing. Um, father being murdered when he was 13 years old. Um, he's been left as the head of the family. He's married, had children, um, been a, a bit of a typical, stereotypical dad, coaching the football team, never missing little league games. Um, then at 9.35 that morning, uh, his wife has reported receiving a voicemail from him saying he's okay, but he is in the building. Um, he didn't actually have to be there that day, but he was seen carrying oxygen tanks into the building. Um tapes have been later found revealing his last words to his partner were that there were more people upstairs and he was going to help them. So the story's fairly limited on him compared to the the last one that you've seen. Mm -hmm. Um, But just the simple fact that he has been in contact with his wife and his last words are, you know, knowing what's going on around you. I mean, as you say, you're in the building, so you're limited what you actually know at the time but you know that it is a serious attack. People are losing their lives left, right and centre. And your last words are, there's more upstairs, I need to go and help them. Mm -hmm. Definitely one of those putting other people's lives in front of yourselves, as is his and the rest of their careers. Yeah, which, I I mean, uh, as Dave's just said, we can't go through them all, but we've been looking at them, we've been reading through them. um, And, I mean... It, it sort of echoes uh, the the last officer. Then we then go on to Officer Thomas Jurgens, uh, and Officer Jurgens was trained as a medic in the army before signing on with the New York State officer uh, on the court. But on September 11th, Officer Officer Jurgens was inside the first tower. Now, as the tower's structural integrity worsened, um, he was warned to get out. But his last radio call from him uh, that were that the people heard was there are people who are there there are people here who need our help um, and obviously remain to help countless people uh, to, to get out um, and unfortunately didn't survive the collapses of, of the towers. Which brings us to Officer Ramon Suarez. Uh, he was a physical fitness guru, coached daughter's elementary track team. Uh, on that morning, he heard the calls for help. His photo was later published in a paper that showed him outside the World Trade Center rescuing a distraught woman. Uh, after the picture was taken, Officer Suarez raced back into the second tower, which unfortunately then collapsed, causing the loss of his life. And now, moving on to uh, Captain Kathy Mazza. 
Uh, now, Captain Maz was the first female commanding officer at the Port Authority Police Academy, and just like many others, uh, Captain Maz and her colleagues responded to the attacks on the World Trade Centre. Now, Maz saw a bottleneck of people trying to escape through the revolving doors at the North Tower and noticed that they were unable to do so because of panic and hysteria. Now, Maz drew a weapon and shot out the glass, uh, allowing many people to escape the building. And she was last seen with Lieutenant Robert Siri. Uh, uh, carrying a woman down the steps when the tower collapsed. Mayor Rudy Giuliani said of Captain Mazza, uh, she was a trailblazer with a career that was truly unique. She had an incredible desire to help people. She is an American hero. And again, uh, another one that uh, has raced in numerous times and uh, to help those and unfortunately paid the ultimate sacrifice. Officer James Nelson. Uh, he was known for saying, when I go out of this world, I want to know I made a difference. Um, on the morning of September 11th, he did just that. Enrolled in the Port Authority Police Academy in 1984, was part of the, again, rescue efforts for the 1993 World Trade Centre bombings. Um, but during the 2001 attack, he was killed whilst evacuating people from the 27th floor after, I think it was one of the last ones you said, uh, he was advised to leave the building and point blank refused, saying there are people who were still trapped that needed his help. Then we have Officer Kenneth Tygen. As a boy, uh, Officer Tygen was scared of two things, police cars and fire trucks. Uh, now, when he's got a job that required him to ride in both of those, his family never stopped teasing him. Now, on September 11th, he heard the calls for help, commandeered a taxi and drove to Ground Zero. Uh, he rushed into the North Tower and rescued several people. Now, when he emerged from the building, he and his partner realised that there was only one respirator left. And uh, Officer Chaitjin smiled at his partner and said, seniority rules. He then grabbed the respirator and rushed back into the tower just prior to collapse. That leads us to Officer John W. Perry, described as not your typical police officer, fluent in four different languages, learning a fifth, uh, running in marathons, he was an extra in Woody, Adam Phil Woody Allen films. Um, and on the morning of September 11th, he was filling in his retirement papers at the precinct uh, with a view to becoming a medical malpractice lawyer. Uh, after hearing about the attacks, he has run, so not commandeered a taxi like the other ones, he has run several blocks to the World uh, Trade Centre before carrying on that running into the building, helping a woman who's fainted, and the last anyone has seen as him is when he's run into the South Tower and then it's collapsed. Uh, leading on to Officer Moira Smith. Uh, she was the first, it says first woman to die in the attacks on September 11th. Now I'm not sure if that's the first, I'm, I'm going to guess it's not the first woman altogether because some must have died when the plane hit. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to imagine it's the first woman police officer to die in the attacks on September 11th. Uh, she was trying to rescue people inside the second tower when it's collapsed. Uh, Officer Smith rescued several people and is credited with saving numerous lives. Uh, she was also involved in the 1991 subway, subway crash in Union Square and was honored with the Distinguished Duty Medal for the dozens of lives she saved on that occasion as well. So she's done it on more than one occasion where she's put her own life at risk to save others and been honoured. And it just goes to show the the people who put the uniform on realise and understand uh, the hazards and the dangers um, and still carry out without a second thought. Yeah. Running into that, running into that building. As I say, it's a different level of proudness because I'm proud of them. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be able to pay tribute to them today um so uh, obviously those the events of uh that day on 9 11 they were horrific to watch i can only imagine what it was like to be there and witness it mm. let alone be there and be involved in it and be involved and be in running it. into the buildings yourself oh. doesn't it doesn't bear thinking about but yeah um as the following the results of that obviously we are a police podcast for police casualties and fatalities, but it isn't just the police that lost their lives on that day. There were 72 police thought to have lost their lives on the actual day, um, in addition to 343 of the fire service, 
eight EMS providers. And obviously that is the day. Um, as a result of the conditions they were working in, the injuries they sustained from the day, there have been hundreds that have lost their lives since then. Um, many of which are, are simply due to the, the smoke and the conditions that they were actually working in, yeah. rather than actual injuries and, and debris falling. But um, as much as this is to honour the police that died on the day, um, there are countless stories out there and we would encourage you to go and look through some of them stories yourself because it, it's listening to the words of heroes and watching the footsteps of heroes. And obviously, we've got to pay tribute to everybody there. I think I think we're at, we're at approximately three thousand people on the day who were killed as a result of what happened on that day. Um, and obviously, we know that as, as Dave says, the number's going to grow because, as well as the three four three of the 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 firefighters, and is it the eight paramedics EMS? Yeah. yeah um, right. You're then looking at countless more because they was working in hazardous and toxic um, an environment and. It, it, it's going to reach to the several hundreds of people who's lost their lives as a result, yeah. like you said, Dave, injuries and, and being there. And to be fair, I'm not, sure how, I'm not sure how much factoring in that is of the likes of there will be obvious people with massive amounts of PTSD, um, yeah. survivors syndrome, is it, mm -hmm. um, who will unfortunately be taking their own lives as a result of it. Yeah. I'm not sure if it'll depend on how well documented and how well diagnosed that stuff is. For that to even count as part of the figures so the, the numbers of people who will have died as a result of this um will never be a hundred percent known because you just won't know now and that's a good thing to mention as well dave because it's not only the people that died on the days died of injuries died of illnesses and viruses and things that uh, of being at ground zero or anything it's obviously like you say the ptsd um suicide Mm. The suiciding definitely increased after 9-11 because it's, as you say, to the guilt, I could have done more. Or why was it, you know, out of a firehouse of 20, two sat there going, why are all them yeah. gone and worse still? Even people not involved, it could be that yeah. they've lost a family member in there and they've, they've been hundreds of miles away from any of the crashes, but they're thinking, why was he on that flight? Why was it not me? Yeah. Why was it her? And have ended up taking their own lives as a result of it. But it's it's really difficult to pin down the numbers and get everyone's story when you're looking at a minimum. I mean, it's 3,000 already. You're looking at hundreds, potentially thousands more. Exactly. And I think um, what I will say is, is that obviously, like Dave said, it's all emergency services, although we are uh, particularly um, paying attention to, obviously, the Thin Blue Line radio where... The Thin Blue Line Radio was obviously looking at the officers that were killing day. Not by any stretch of the imagination, we send uh, you know our love and thoughts out to all of the countless families, friends, colleagues, partner agencies, brothers and sisters in blue, green, you know, red, you know, even civilians who were doing exactly. the job that the police would do because the, all of them will have put their lives on the line to help other people. Which exactly, is a job that they're not employed to do. But because there are so many heroes, they've decided to uh, put everything on the line for the sake of saving as many people as they can. Exactly, exactly. Um, now, I, I've, as a result of forming uh, Thin Blue Line Radio, uh, I do have numerous links um, that I have linked in with people. One particular link uh, that I made was with uh, a police officer in um, Illinois, in Schiller Police Department. A uh, very good friend of mine, Mike Marazzo. Um, I've spoke with Mike on his podcast. His podcast is Hand, Handcuffs and Sawdust. Um, and it was uh, it's an excellent uh, podcast because it just gives us the understanding of what the American police go through. But obviously Mike and, and his colleagues and his friends... Uh, they do a lot of woodwork. He does a, do a lot of memorial woodwork for the Thin Blue Line um, in the US. Mm. Um, and I spoke with Mike on, on his podcast, and I think it is on there. I think it's down as the 9-11 commemorative edition. Um, and we spoke with Mike, um, who, uh, you know, uh, it, it was quite 
even then, several years later, quite emotional for him to talk about. Um, like it would be for all of the, the attacks that's happened over here over the years and when we hear that an officer's been killed, um, it just hits that raw nerve. Yeah. Um, but yeah, be, before, before I do want to hand over to Mike because Mike has kindly done a little bit of a roll call for September 11th for the Thin Blue Line, not taking into a, you know, not taking out of the equation, like Dave said, the civilians, the the fire, the paramedic, the doctors, the nurses, everyone involved in that day that has got any illness or have passed away or anything like that. Um, so we just want to thank them, all of them for the service. Um, and, you know, for all those that are, have passed away as a result, Mike is going to now do, uh, kind of do a roll call for us. And we've just got to remember that um, irrelevant to the time, distance, there were all the brothers and sisters in blue. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Mike now. Um, and, and just thanks very much for joining us. And thanks for all those who uh, were tragically killed on 9-11. Always remembered, never forgotten. From the Port Authority Police Department, Superintendent Ferdinand V. Maroney, 63. Chief James A. Romito, 51. Lieutenant Robert D. Siri, 39. Inspector Anthony P. Infante, Jr., 47. Captain Kathy Nancy Maza, 46. Sergeant Robert M. Colfers, 49. Donald James McIntyre, 38. Walter Arthur McNeil, 53. Joseph Michael Navas, 44. James Nelson, 40. Alphonse J. Niedermeyer, 40. James Wendell Parham, 32. Dominic A. Pizzullo, 36. Antonio J. Rodriguez, 35. Richard Rodriguez, 31. Bruce Albert Reynolds, 41. Christopher C. Amoroso, 29. Maurice V. Berry, 48. Clinton Davis Sr., 38. Donald a. Foreman, 53. Greg J. Froner, 46. Uhuru Gonga Houston, 32. George G. Howard, 44. Thomas E. Gorman, 41. Stephen Huxco, Jr., 44. Paul William Jurgens, 47. Liam Callahan, 44. Paul Lazachinsky, 49. David Prudencio Lamagni, 27. John Joseph Lennon, Jr., 44. John Dennis Levi, 50. James Francis Lynch, 47. John P. Scala, 31. Walwyn W. Stewart, Jr., 28. Kenneth F. Tichen, 31. Nathaniel Webb, 56. Michael T. Holy, 34. New York City Police Department. Sergeant Timothy A. Roy, Sr., 36. Sergeant John Gerard Coughlin, 43. Sergeant Rodney C. Gillis, 33. Sergeant Michael S. Curtin, 45. Detective Joseph V. Vigiano, 34. Detective Claude Daniel 
Richards, 46. Moira Ann Smith, 38, posthumously named Glamour Magazine's Woman of the Year. Ramon Suarez, 45. Paul Talty, 40. Santos Valentin, Jr., 39. Walter E. Weaver, 30. Ronald Philip Clofer, 39. Thomas N. Langone, 39. James Patrick Leahy, 38. Brian Grady McDonald, 38. John William Perry, 38. An actor on shows like NYPD Blue and One Life to Live, who was filing his police force retirement papers that morning. Glenn Kieran Pettit, 30. John D'Alera, 47. Vincent Dons, 38. Jerome M. P. Dominguez, 37. Stephen P. Driscoll, 38. Mark Joseph Ellis, 26. And Robert Fazio, Jr., 41. Thank you.